Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 8, verse, starting at verse 30 through verses 47. It's the end of the chapter. John 8, 30 through 47. And the title of today's message is Free Indeed. Let me just pray before I start. <clears throat> Father, we just thank you, Lord, for yet again another opportunity, Lord, to come before your throne, to come, my Lord, at the foot of the cross, my Lord, to acknowledge, Lord, not the, the blessings in our life, Lord, but to acknowledge who you are and what was accomplished on the cross at Calvary, Father. Lord, we pray that he who has an ear to hear today, hear what the spirit of the Lord has to say. As your word goes forth, Lord, I pray that every heart, my Lord, the soil of every heart, Lord, is turned up, my Lord, to receive the implanted word, my Lord, of the living God, Lord, that it may take root, Lord, in each and every one of our lives. Father, have your way here today. Holy Spirit, have your way. Minister to us according to each and every one of our needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Starting at verse 30. Then many who heard him say these things believed in him. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But we are descendants of Abraham, they said. We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. <clears throat> yes, I realize that you are descendants of Abraham. And yet some of you are trying to kill me because there's no room in your heart for my message. I'm telling you what I saw when I was with my father, but you are following the advice of your father. Our father is Abraham, they declared. No, Jesus replied, for if you were really the children of Abraham, you would follow his example. Instead, you are trying to kill me because I told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham never did such a thing. No, you are imitating your real father. They replied, we, we, we aren't illegitimate children. God himself, himself is our true father. Jesus told them, if God were your father, you would love me because I have come to you from God. I am not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand what I am saying? It's because you can't even hear me. For you are, for you are the children of your father, the devil. And you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character for he is a liar and the father of lies. So when I tell the truth, you just naturally don't believe me. Which of you can truthfully accuse me of sin? And since I'm telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? Anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God, but you don't listen because you don't belong to God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Point number one, true freedom comes through faith in Jesus Christ. True freedom comes <clears throat> excuse me, through faith in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the Jews that Jesus was speaking to in this text, thought that they were spiritually free because they were descendants of Abraham. They said, we're descendants of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it you say you will become free? In other words, they're saying we are already free. But Jesus explains that even though they don't see it and they're not acknowledging it, they are actually enslaved to something that is called sin. And then he shows them the way to spiritual freedom. After stating that they are slaves to sin, he says that the slave is not a permanent member of the family, 
and does not remain in the house forever. They can't remain in the house forever. The son is a permanent member of the family and will remain a part of the family forever. In other words, they're not a part of God's covenant or God's family because they are enslaved to sin, which we know as believers here. And if you don't know, sin separates from God, right? So which sin, sin, sin separated, separates them from God and which would make them not unto God, but unto the devil, child, children of the devil, right? Make sense? And because of the sin that they were enslaved to, they're considered not to be true sons of God, like they were portraying themselves to be. They were enjoying the privileges of being a true child of God while being held captive. This is what Jesus is saying. While being held captive to their sins. Romans 9, 4, 7, 4 and 5 says, they are the people of Israel chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them and gave them his law. He gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their ancestors, and Christ himself was an Israelite. As, for, as far as him, his human nature is concerned, and he is God, the one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. I say that because these Jews here, uh, upon Jesus confronting them, were in danger of losing those very privileges, the privilege of being a part of God's covenant, of being a part of God's circle, his family. But Jesus didn't want that to happen. He was trying to open their eyes and have them come to the truth so that they can be set free. He gave them an invitation, an invitation to what's called spiritual freedom. He's saying, in other words, come to me and I will give you true freedom. As he was saying these words to them, many came to believe in him. Now I want you to follow what I'm going to say. Many came, the scripture says, to believe in him, right? Jesus was addressing the following comments to the Jews who had believed him. So you would think that these people came to know Christ through genuine faith, right? But when you dive a little deeper and you begin to study, you'll see in this chapter uh, that, that we're gonna, we learned that not only were they slaves to sin, they were also looking to kill him. And God was not their father, as Jesus stated. He said they're children of the devil, right? And they were also accusing Jesus of having a demon. But they were liars. They were lying. So why does John say here that these Jews believed in Jesus? These believers that he's referring to here in verses 30 and 31 are just like those back in John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25 which says this, John 2, 23 through 25. Because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust him, in him. But verse 24, but Jesus did not trust them. Why? Because he knew all about people. No one needed to tell him about the human nature. For he knew what was in each person's heart. In other words, they only believed after seeing Jesus perform miracles. They only believed after they saw what he can do. But the scripture says Jesus did not trust them because he knew their hearts. In other words, he knew that their faith was superficial. He knew that their faith was false. They had what's called a false faith. That's real. That's a real thing. And that false faith was based on what they saw. How many Christians today are similar to that? How many Christians today can even relate to that? Right? I know at first, years ago, over 20 years ago, I was first drawn because I seen these miracle signs and wonders on TV. But I could not remain because what drew me was false, right? I know the healings were real, 
everything that was happening was real. But what got my attention was the healing because I needed healing. And what happened was my faith got a boost for a moment. So when we see these things, our faith gets a boost for a moment. Or we might even read that a blind eye is open. A deaf ear is unclogged. A cripple might even be healed. And then we get all emotional. And then we get goosebumps, right? But as time goes on, the emotions die down. The goosebumps go away. And we find out that we have to build a relationship with Jesus that takes time. In a world that wants everything right now and in a hurry, we don't have time, right? We don't have time for that. And then on top of that, we have to be obedient to the word of God and live a life that reflects Christ-like characteristics too. God, you're asking for too much. That's called false faith. And we see the same false faith in John 6, 60, which says this. Many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Because many of Jesus' disciples turned away from him. After he said some things, guess what? That they did not like. That went against how they wanted it, how they were living. And then they realized that he wasn't going to deliver them from Rome, from the Romans. He wasn't going to do what they wanted him to do. He was a great healer, but his words and his teachings were hard to accept, they said. Or a better word would be to obey. And naturally, they are. But we have what's called the supernatural guidance of the Holy Spirit as believers. Jesus says that if they continue in his word, that if they keep on, they are truly his disciples. False faith is, an, is, is implied here. And other New Testament texts also support this. Like the power, the, the Jesus' parable of the sower in Luke chapter 8, verses 5 through 15. I'm not going to read all the verses, but he mentions the seed that was sown on the rocky, thin soil. These people received the word with joy, but it took no root. They believed for a while, but in the time of temptation, the trial fell away. The same was true of the seed sown among the thorny ground. Thorny ground. Eventually, the thorns did what? Choke out the word. So that it could not, did not bear fruit. John mentions in 1 John 2.19, the false teachers who went out from the church, but never were genuine believers. Paul mentions false apostles who disguised themselves as workers of righteousness in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. We see the same thing nowadays, right? People come in. They serve for a while in some capacity in the church, some area. They come to the faith, maybe in a time of trial or even in a, a time of need, or maybe because of other people, friends that were with them on that day, right? And once they've been delivered and their need has been met, they're gone. They're gone. They may have even come to the Lord because someone told them, God will bless you. God will deliver you. God will solve all of your problems and you'll live happily ever after. But when things don't go as they hoped or as they wanted, wanted them to go, or when God does not do what they feel or they think that he should do, they fall away. That's why the word can't take root. And those same ones even deny the faith now that they once professed. After Jesus tells them that they will know the truth and the truth will make them free, guess what they did? They do what we do. They got defensive. They got defensive by saying that they have never been enslaved to anyone. What do you mean you will 
be set free. I am free, in other words, they're saying. But they were spiritually bound, held captive. They were blinded to their self-righteousness and spiritual pride. Yeah, the religion was impressive. The way that they portrayed themselves were impressive. It was attractive to the eye, but their hearts were far from God. Matthew 23, 20, verses 27 and 28 says, Jesus, who knows the hearts of men, says this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. They thought that they were religious. They thought that they were doing what was right in God's eyes, but their sin deceived them so that they didn't, and they said they did not see that their own slavery to the sin that held them captive. True spiritual freedom starts when we recognize that we are guilty sinners in the sight of God. There's no deed, there's no work, there's nothing that man, that humanity can do to get us to heaven. If our deeds can get us to heaven, then that Christ died for nothing. He died in vain. These Jews were trusting in their religious heritage as descendants of Abraham to put them in right standing with God, but that's not the case. Matthew 3, 9 says, and do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. In other words, your heritage is of no value. Your righteousness, the righteousness of others cannot make a person acceptable to God. Each person has to stand before God as an individual and be held accountable for their own accounts. This false faith that they're portraying here and sometimes believers now fall into will not save from sin. True faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is what makes us free, sets us free, keeps us free. True faith is recognized, like I said, we are sinners, but saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. True, truly, truly repenting of our sins and not going back to them again. Going back to them again and again and again and again and again. That's being enslaved. It has us. When something has us, it controls us. When something controls us, we're consistently going back to it. Right? Believing in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. This word believe, I'm gonna, I'm gonna break it down real quick and then move on. It means to be convicted by the truth that will lead you to committing your life to someone or something. In this case, it's Jesus Christ, right? So believe means to commit. Right? And through our commitment to Jesus, we can now get to know him more personally and abide in him so that we can, he can abide in us, so that we can truly live in spiritual freedom. Point number two, true freedom comes from knowing Christ and abiding in his word. True freedom comes from knowing Christ and abiding in his word. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Jesus says, if you continue, continue, continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Believers, us as believers have to be committed. We should be committed to God and abide in the word of truth. Commitment is the evidence of true faith in Jesus Christ. Commitment is everything, 
right? In a relationship, in a marriage, right? My commitment to my wife states, right? That we are one. If I step out of that commitment, I'm not abiding in that. Commitment is the evidence of my marriage, my commitment to her. We need to, we, I, I believe it's got to understand first what Jesus Christ's word is to what it means in order to continue or abide in it. Christ's word obviously is the word of God. We all know that, right? Christ's word is everything he taught summed up in all that he is and all that he has accomplished for us on the cross. Jesus said that all scripture, all scripture speaks of me. He told the Jews in John 5, 38 through 40. And you do not have this message in your hearts because you do not believe me. The one he sent to you, believe me, right? You search the scriptures because you think they have, they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. So to continue or abide in Christ's word implies that we have to have started in it. In order to continue in something, you have to have started in it. I can't continue cutting my grass if I didn't first start to cut it. Continue or abide means to dwell or to be at home in. Meaning we don't just visit the word on an, as an occasional guest, occasionally. We move in there, we sleep there, we wake up there, and then we return there every day and every night because why? We are home in his word. His word should be shaping our worldview. It must govern and guide our thinking. It must govern and guide our attitudes. It must govern and guide our speech. It must go govern and guide our behavior. There shouldn't be any area in the believer's life that is not subject to God's word or even influenced by it. Continue or abide in the word of God means to spend time in again and again and again. Continue. You keep doing it. Repetition. So my question to you, church. Are we abiding? Are we abiding in God's word? Write that down. Am I abiding in God's word? Do we live there? Do we know what it says in regards to our situations? Do we enjoy the comfort, even the correction, the blessings that it offers? Are we obeying the word of the living God? Let me suggest something to you that might transform and revolutionize your life. Turn off the phones. Get off social media. Put it down. Turn off the TV. Turn off the computer. Get rid of all distractions. And for about an hour a day, if you spend time reading the word, meditating on the word, memorizing the word, the only living word in existence, which is the word of the living God with the prayer that you might get to know Christ better. It will change your life. It will change your life. It will restore relationships. It restores marriages. It restores mine. It restores relationship with son and father, daughter and mother, parent and children. It restores Joshua 1.8 says this. By the way, you're not going to get any better counseling than the word of God. Through the influence and the power of the Holy Spirit. You can go see any psychiatrist, therapist, whatever you want to do. You're not going to get anything better than the living word of God. Been there. Done that. Didn't work. Doesn't work. This works. 
The word works as you work it. So work it. So it can work. Joshua 1.8 says this. Very famous scripture. Study this book of instruction continually. Keyword. Continually. Meditate on it once a week, once a month, day and night. Day and night. There's a reason he's saying this. Day and night. So you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Rather than being a slave of sin, you will know the truth. And it is the truth that will make you free. Jesus Christ is that truth. So if the son makes you free, he says, you will be free indeed. Abiding, abiding in Christ's word of truth continually, <clears throat> continually is what sets you free, what is what makes you free continuously over and over and over and over, not just for 20 minutes on a Sunday. No, over. Repetition. Repetition. It will set you free. Free from what? Free from spiritual ignorance. Free, free from spiritual pride. Free from self-righteousness. Free from inheriting curses. Free from the lust of the flesh. Free from the pride of life. Like I said, demonic strongholds. Even if you'll be free from the cares of this world. Those who do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, guess what the scripture says about them? They are in spiritual darkness and bound, bound by demonic forces. Ephesians 4.18 says this. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and harden their hearts against him. They cannot, they will not understand the things of the spirit of God. We cannot understand the things of the spirit, the, uh, the, the spirit of God. It's only through knowing Jesus Christ that we have spiritual insight and that we will know all the riches of God's grace that are ours. <clears throat> That have freely been given to us. Why is it only through knowing Christ. Which is the truth. That sets free. Because truth liberates. Truth sets free. Truth releases. <clears throat> Hosea 4.6 says this. And I chose this translation on purpose. The New Living Translation. It says, my people are destroyed because they do not know me. The other translation, ESV, would say, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. Not knowing Christ is having a lack of knowledge. If we don't know Jesus, we have no knowledge of one who he is and the spiritual freedom that belongs to us as children of the Lord. And it will make us ignorant to the things of the spirit. Ignorance will keep people bound in bondage and lead them to eternal destruction. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people, let me translate that in plain English. My people will be sent to hell because they don't know me. Did that simplify it? My people will be sent to hell for not acknowledging me, for not continuing, not abiding in me. <clears throat> that spiritual ignorance keeps people from knowing the living, true God, like it did these Jews. And it will prevent us from being conformed to the image of Christ, church. 
Ignorance cuts people off from their inheritance from God. If I don't know my parents left me money, guess what? I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to go to Florida or wherever to go get it. If I don't know what's mine, I'm wandering astray. I'm, uh, I'm lost. Everything that he is, that Jesus is, everything that Jesus accomplished on the cross, abiding in Christ's word is what sets us free and acknowledging what was done on the cross for us from being slaves of sin. When Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits a sin is a slave of sin. Now, he's not, he's not stating that committing a single act of sin will enslave a person. But the same way that you should continue in him, when you continue in the, in the sin, right? Now you're under its domination. And whatever dominates us, like I said earlier, controls us. As we abide in Christ's word, we can experience consistent, consistent victory over the sin that used to dominate and control us by beginning with our minds. Where it all begins, right? The mind is the battlefield. Putting on the mind of Christ, which is the word of God, is the only way we get to control our thoughts and our life and steer our life. What a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Our lives, why? Because our lives are steered, directed by our thoughts. I want to make it clear that religion, like these Jews thought, does not set cannot set a person free from being a slave to sin. It will not. These Jews were as religious as they could be, and yet Jesus still told them they were slaves to sin. They were trying to kill the sinless son of God. They thought that they were spiritually free, but they were not. They were bound. They were slaves to sin, he says. True spiritual freedom is not the freedom to sin but the freedom not to sin. Church, the Holy Spirit is the one who guides us. He's the only one that can guide us into all truth. He gives us the supernatural ability to go against the natural. He gives us the supernatural ability to walk in obedience. The word of God is so hard to, to, to follow. Naturally, it is. But supernaturally, it's not through the empowerment, the supernatural empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I think that's hard for a lot of believers to grab a hold of. The Spirit of God gives us that supernatural ability that we need to walk in obedience. He has given us everything that pertains to what? Life and godliness. Living our life here and obeying the scriptures. Imitating Christ. I'm going to close with these. I have a few verses <clears throat> I'm going to read, which is from Romans chapter 7. If you have your Bibles, turn there. Romans chapter 7, starting at verse 14 through 25. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. The Apostle Paul said this in Romans 7, 14 through 25, starting at verse 14. Listen to what the Apostle says. Listen to this. The trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me. <clears throat> For I am all too human, a slave to sin. <clears throat> the great apostle saying this. I don't really understand myself. For I want to do what is right. But I do not do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Verse 16. But if I know that I'm doing what is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing it wrong. It is the sin 
living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good in me, nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing it. It is the sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle, he says in verse 21. I have discovered this principle of life, that what I want to do, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. But there is another power within me that is at war within my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. Verse 24. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And I love the last verse, which is 25. Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is? In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to it. There's only one way to conquer our sin nature and be spiritually free in what he's saying. Because then he goes on to chapter 8 and say, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's only believing in Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior and allowing our lives to be guided by the power of the Holy Spirit. Being free indeed comes from knowing Jesus Christ through genuine faith, not a false faith, as I mentioned, and abiding in the word of God, continuing in the word of God, continuing in your walk with God, continuing in your commitment to God, continuing as a child of God Almighty. The apostle said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. In other words, if you look at me, you're going to fall. But if you look at him, you're going to be good because he's the solid rock. He's a solid foundation that cannot be shaken, that cannot be moved. He is almighty. He's all powerful. He's the restorer of persons. He's a restorer, a mender of relationships. Amen. Amen? But it takes two. It takes two to mend something, to fix something. He's already ready to fix it. He's already in place waiting for us to come to him, to agree with him, to continue, to abide in the faith to continue fighting the good fight of faith. Let's continue, church, in our walk with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, regardless of what's going on out there in the world. Regardless. Don't focus on that. I know crazy things are going on. You pray for them. That's it. Always resemble Christ. Always allow people to look at you as a mirror reflecting Jesus Christ. Amen? If you're still a slave to something here today, keep in mind, Jesus offers you true freedom, true spiritual freedom that is only found in him. He wants to make us free so that we will be free indeed. Let's stand as I close. Invitation stands. The altar is open. Remember, God is always here waiting for us. Waiting for us. Sometimes we think we're waiting on the Lord. No, he's always waiting on us to make the move. He's always ready to move and go on our behalf and to bring us deeper, take us deeper. He's always willing, ready, willing, and able, I should say, right? He's always ready, willing, and able to receive back what was once his, and that is mankind. Jesus Christ came to restore relationship between man and God. 
We were once lost, but now we're found. Jesus Christ died for our sins. And he who believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So let us choose today to continue, to continue, to continue. I know it's repetitive and it's redundant. To continue, to continue in the faith. Abide in Jesus Christ. Abiding in the word of the living God. The only word that can pierce through the heart of man. The only word that can transform the life of a human being. That is amazing. Witnessing, experiencing it myself. A man that has been through much, much difficulty. Born disabled. I already had, the world was already against me. But then came Jesus Christ in my life. And he made a way where there was no way. He restored me. He put me back together. He pieced me together. He knit us in the womb of our mother. He is our creator. He is the founder, the author, the finisher of our faith. Nothing else matters. House, cars, money. It don't matter. What you can't take with you, guess what? Don't matter. What matters is relationships with people and with God. We were created to have a relationship with him. That's why we crave relationships with one another, with people, men and women. We crave relationships. We don't want to be lonely. I'm lonely. We crave it because we were created to have a relationship with God Almighty. He's a restorer, church. He's a restorer. He's a healer. He's still a healer. Amen? Amen. Whatever it is you're praying for, you're asking God for, continue in his word. Oh, continue abiding in him. And have faith that what you ask will come to pass as long as it's in the will of God. Because I guarantee you, you will see the fruit of that. And if you don't, it's for a reason. It's never God's fault. We're always the one that we got to reflect. Amen? Amen? Let's imitate Christ. Father, I just thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you first and foremost for your word. The word that became flesh and dwelt among us, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for that living sacrifice, Lord. Your word says that your life was not taken from you, Jesus, but that you offered it up. You laid it down as a ransom for men. Lord, you love us like no other, Lord. Search each and every heart here today, Lord. Search our hearts here today, right here, right now, Holy Spirit. Whatever, my Lord, is weighing on our hearts, Lord. Whatever is weighing on our minds, Lord. Whatever it may be, Father, I ask, Lord, for restoration, Lord. As we, my Lord, commit, Lord, to abiding in you, Lord, as we commit to continue, Lord, in first our relationship with you, Lord. Lord, I just ask that you have your way here today, Lord. I know that you minister to us according to our need, my Lord. And I just thank you because you are the restorer, Lord. You are the healer, Lord. Your word says you are the way when there was no way. You offered a way to heaven, Lord, because there was no other. You became the ultimate sacrifice. You, Lord, continued, Lord. Amen, my Lord. What the Father has sent you here to do, which was the will of God that you may lay down your life for the church, for us as believers, for the world, Lord. And we thank you, Lord. Lord, and I ask, Lord, that we can hold true to the commitment that we have made. When we acknowledge you as Savior and Lord, Father, I pray that we don't cling too much to the Savior, but that we cling also to the Lord, Father. And we acknowledge you as Master, Lord. For your word says that if we love you, we will obey you. Help us to continue and abide in, my Lord, the faith in you, Lord Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Lord. Father, have your way with each and every one of us. Bless us, Father. Even correct us, comfort us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for you are the restorer, Lord. You, my Lord, will deserve all the glory and honor, Lord. Have your way, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. And the church said, Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord.